In the wake of the riots and forced conversions of 1391 to 2, and the voluntary conversions of so many Jews at the end of the 14th and in the early 15th centuries, by the time we get to the second decade of the 15th century, scholars imagine that perhaps a third of all Iberian juries, a third of the Sephardim, had converted to Christianity which, if our estimation of 200,000 Sephardic Jews on the eve of 1391 is correct, that would amount to somewhere between 60 and 70,000 Jews who took up the cross. When we look at the time period from 1391 to 1416, when the conversionary pressures exerted by the kingdoms of Castile and Aragon seem to have eased up a bit, what we note is that Jews had been killed, and Jews, yes, had been forcibly and even had voluntarily converted. But what ultimately is going to play a role in the fate of the Jews, the fate which we know about, which looms for them at the end of the 15th century, the fate of the Jews, interestingly, was going to be bound up with those Jews who had decided to cross over into Christianity. One can imagine that upon conversion, what did Jews do, whether their choice was forced or whether they voluntarily decided to join the Christian faith? They remained in the same houses in which they lived. Their employment opportunities were the same. They went back to work at the same place they worked the day before. Essentially, their social relationships remained intact. But over the course of the years, those Jews who had converted slowly began to move to neighborhoods which had been seen as Christian areas, somewhat off limits to them. They began to take positions within the economy that were forbidden to them as Jews. We find Jews, for example, involved in municipal government, being involved in the court system of the society. Slowly, the Jews begin to move out of the areas in which they lived and, as well, begin to explore economic opportunities outside of the traditional Jewish occupations. And the Christians? The Christians who had yearned for their Jews' conversion for so many years, who had spent so much energy in the last decade of the 14th and the first decade and a half of the 15th century to attempt to lure the Jews to their faith, they weren't prepared for so many, for thousands of Jewish converts. There was no attempt to integrate them within Christian society. The various churches did not help them make the transition to their new community and to their new religious ideals. In fact, they began to look upon these Jews who had converted, the conversos, the converts, in a somewhat suspicious way. They began to make distinctions between cristianos viejos, old Christians, translated as those who were Christians before 1391, and cristianos nuevos, new Christians, those Jews who had converted in 1391 and in the years following. And the sense that many Christians had is that somehow these Jews who had been newly converted somehow were not to be trusted. Their fidelity to Christianity was something that had to be examined. The Jews generally, in the wake of the two hard decades in the end of the 14th and the early 15th century, began to resume their lives as Jews, with less pressure upon them. In the kingdom of Castile, in the central part of the peninsula, we find that Castilian Jews in the, in the mid-15th century start moving away from the larger cities in which they lived and begin to move to the small towns and villages scattered throughout this kingdom. In the kingdom of Aragon to the east, ah, uh, there was a different story.
there many Jewish communities did not really survive the onslaught of the riots and then the conversions. In fact, many Jewish communities in the Kingdom of Aragon simply did not revive themselves after the riots. The Jewish community in Barcelona pretty much came to an end with the riots of 1391. So in the central plateau of Castile, Jews again begin to create community in the hinterlands, while in Aragon they try to hang on as best as they could. Interestingly, in the 15th century, the Jew status seems to have stabilized, and they do enjoy a measure of success. Especially true in the Kingdom of Valencia, which was part of the crown of Aragon, where although the Jewish community in Valencia comes to an end with the riots, the Jews in Murviedro begin to experience, a little bit north of Valencia, experience somewhat, if you will, of an upsurge in population and economic activity. The fate of Sephardic Jews ultimately was going to lie with these conversos. As these conversos began to move out of their Jewish neighborhoods and took jobs that had been off limits to them as Jews, and when they encountered other Christians in their daily life, tensions began to arise. People began to suspect that the reason why these Jews had converted was not because of a true belief in Jesus, but rather they had converted for opportunistic reasons. Maybe they converted, some said, precisely to get those jobs which had been off limits to them or to move into the neighborhoods which had looked er earlier askance upon their presence. Riots break out in mid-15th century Toledo. Riots against the king, but riots now against the new Christians. And the Jews? The Jews were not harmed. It was the new Christians and the body of new Christians which now began to be seen and viewed as a lightning rod for many of the economic and political difficulties which afflicted Castile and Aragon. As we move through the 15th century, the Jews continue living their lives while the new Christians are under increasing pressure. There is a debate within Castilian and Aragonese society a debate which wonders about what to do with the new Christian population. There's social and economic tension. Riots are breaking out against them. Many throughout the Iberian Peninsula in the kingdoms of Castile and Aragon begin to argue that the new Christians, while publicly observing Christianity, privately within their homes are secretly observing Judaism. They began to hurl epithets against them, maranos, a term which probably means swine. Yes, these people were not to be trusted. Their Christianity but a mask. And the belief begins to emerge that deep down, these conversos are really secretly Jewish. There's a debate, as I said, within Christian society. Some say that these new Christians if they're observing Judaism, if they're Judaizing, then they're heretics. And if they're heretics, they should be put to death. On the other hand, more sensitive individuals advance the argument that there were so many thousands of conversos and Christian society did not try hard to integrate them within their social groupings that it really required a massive educational effort on the part of both the church and the government to try to integrate these individuals better with other Christians. While this debate raged, a third position began to emerge. This position essentially put forth the idea that we don't know about the religious fealty of this converso population. And we shouldn't make any judgments about it until we have further evidence. And how is it that we should gather the evidence? Well, the ideas began to emerge that perhaps we should use, the Iberian said, a papal institution. A papal institution which was dedicated to investigate the religious character of the people who were being examined early in the 13th century, the papacy had founded the Inquisition, mainly 
to deal with the heresy which they had imagined they had newly found within southern France. The Albigensians, the Cathars, they were the subject of the earliest papal inquisition. And they were staffed by the Franciscans and the Dominicans. And now what some people in the Iberian Peninsula were arguing is that there should be an attempt to have the papal inquisition transformed into a tool of Iberian governments in order to examine their own problem of Iberian conversos. It is around in the 1460s and 1470s as Ferdinand of Aragon and Isabella of Castile, uh, the King of Aragon and the Queen of Castile marry, and eventually their two kingdoms are joined, that Ferdinand and Isabella lobby the Pope to have a papal inquisition on Iberian soil, but with a twist, that it should be subject to crown control. The papacy refuses. Ferdinand and Isabella press on. And finally, in 1478, at a time of a weakened papacy at Rome, Pope Sixtus IV grants Ferdinand and Isabella to establish inquisitions in their own domain, but subject to their own control, to the crown control of Castile and Aragon. The Inquisition begins, fascinatingly, in the city of Seville, precisely where the riots had broken out first in 1391. In the southern part of the Iberian Peninsula, where most of the conversions were to be found, the tribunals allowed in Seville in 1480 and start in 1481. The next major uh, inquisitorial tribunal is established in the central part of Castile. The inquisitorial tribunals begin in Ciudad Real, just south of Toledo, in the central part of Castile. And moving to the crown of Aragon, in the city of Saragossa, on the Ebro River, in the center of the crown of Aragon. And these tribunals begin to work investigating whether indeed the conversos, the new Christians, were they good Christians and seemingly just in need of a good Christian education or were they secretly observing Judaism at home? And if so, they were heretics. And then the challenge would be how to extirpate this heretical strain from Christian society. What do the inquisitorial tribunals find out? Oh, they gather evidence, and sometimes they gather evidence against the will of the people who are called upon to testify. We know as well that they gather evidence sometimes by torturing those who were accused. The object of the Inquisition, the Inquisition went after the new Christians. Essentially, the Jews were spared. The Jews were allowed to observe Judaism. The object of their investigations was the body of new Christian individuals and their religious leanings. The Inquisition, over the course of the ninth decade of the 15th century, over the course of the 1480s, began to report back to the Crown that indeed many of these new Christians are secretly observing Judaism. Indeed, are Maranos. Are we as historians to believe the claims that the inquisitorial tribunals put forth? Was it possible that they simply were dissimulating, not telling the truth for their own venal goals? It's a very, very interesting question. But the records of the inquisitorial tribunals were kept secret. They didn't use it for public relations measures. And the inquisitorial tribunals, although gathering evidence in ways which are offensive to us, these tribunals took much testimony and wrote the testimony down from a variety of witnesses. We also know that the inquisitorial tribunals did not decide that everyone under their microscope was guilty, but rather were able to acknowledge that many of the people who were accused were indeed innocent. So were these new Christians indeed 
secretly Jewish? I think we need to step back from the pressures of the 15th century, from the religious wars of the 15th century, and from the questions of whether those documents which the inquisitors produced were reliable, and think about the question in a general fashion. Thousands of Jews had converted to Christianity, some forced, some willingly. What do we imagine this population was like? Well, you'd be correct if you imagined that some who converted were terribly embarrassed about their decisions. They sought privately in every way that they could to continue to observe their ancestral faith, to continue to observe Judaism. Maintaining ties with Jewish relatives, with Jewish religious figures, attempting to observe Jewish law. And you'd be correct if you imagined that on the other hand there were many Jews who once they converted to Christianity may have looked back upon their decision and were very glad. They were happy they left Judaism behind. Simply they now could live a life without pressure, without tension, without threat of harm. And they tried their best to be good converts to Christianity. In fact, many of them rise even to post significant posts within the Catholic Church. Remember Shlomo Halevi, the rabbi in Burgos, becomes the great theologian Pablo de Santa Maria and returns to Burgos as its bishop. Geronimo de Santa Fe, who was the lead disputant at the, con at the disputation in Tortosa, originally starts out as a student of Shlomo Halevi as Yehoshua Halorki of the Aragonese town of al -Kanif. And there were many others. Surely these Jews who converted to Christianity believed in Christianity. But what about the majority? Majority of those Jews who converted to Christianity. If you would imagine that they represented a wide range of fealty to their new faith, you would be correct. And many times for reasons which were not theological. They lived and continued to live within the Jewish quarter. If their Jewish relatives continued to invite them for Sabbath or holiday meals. If some Jewish friends would remind them when particular important days of the Jewish calendar uh, came around. For example, telling them about the fast of Yom Kippur or that that Passover was going to fall out the next week they would observe Judaism more. And for those who lived in small towns or in villages or who traveled far or moved to other towns or to Christian neighborhoods within the cities in which they had lived as Jews, maybe some of them slowly severed their ties even more seriously with their former co-religionists. And now let's return. Now let's return to the documents from the inquisitorial tribunals which we now can view and now can read. And we read how these conversos, some of them observing Shabbat, some making sure not to eat leavened bread, chametz on Pesach, some attending Seder meals, others fasting on Yom Kippur, some making sure that they could eat kosher meat as often as they could. What do we do with that evidence? But as I said, if we take our perspective maybe from the present day and look back upon those times, we don't necessarily need to fall into the same conclusions which the inquisitors did. Oh, if you read about one, uh, uh, one individual, one woman, by the way, who the Inquisition uh, was investigating and they found out that she did light candles Friday night, truly a Jewish custom. But if you read the testimony fully, it also says that before lighting candles, she would cross herself. And if you look at the individual who was accused correctly, or maybe truthfully, of fasting on Yom Kippur, you would also find out that he observed the birthday of the Savior at the end of December, and also made sure to attend church on Easter. So what do we make of these individuals? Should we imagine that they were all Maranos, they were all secret Jews,
only publicly showing a face of Christianity while in the privacy of their own homes observing Judaism to the best of their ability? Or rather, should we imagine that the new Christian population oh, ran the gamut of observance of both Judaism and Christianity? From those who I said who observed Judaism the best they could, to those who climbed high in the church hierarchy, and to the majority of the new Christians who observed aspects of Judaism and aspects of Christianity. Let's not imagine in retrospect that these were grand theologians, grand theologians who had attempted some kind of synthetic vision of both of those faiths. But rather, we should imagine plain individuals who, insofar as generations passed and they slowly became comfortable with Christianity, observed more and more of their new Christian religion, and yet at the same time, while Jews uh, spoke to them, made contact with them, family members were in touch with them, still observed aspects of the Judaism of their parents and of their grandparents. But the inquisitors reported on their findings to Ferdinand and Isabella. And to the inquisitors' mind, what they had found is that throughout the new Christian population, there was rampant observance of, Jude observance of Judaism. And that means, ultimately, that these conversos were heretics. Yes, they put some to death at the stake, in altos de fe, in displays of the faith, public displays of the faith. And they also sentenced others to penance. They should do penitence in an attempt to become good Christians. But what the inquisitors tell Ferdinand and Isabella is that the souls of the new Christians are at stake. And more so, there's even greater difficulty. Because there's such rampant heresy within Castile and within Aragon, there might be a fear that they could infect the Cristianos viejos, the old Christians, as well. Ferdinand and Isabella are mindful, are mindful of the results which the inquisitors have reported to them. Ferdinand and Isabella understand already from the 1480s of the need to separate Jews from Christians. So therefore, Jews couldn't, in the language of the time, infect the new Christians. In town after town, throughout Andalusia and even further north, Jews and Christians are separated. They make sure that legislation is passed in the Iberian parliaments to that effect as well. There is an attempted expulsion somewhat successful from Andalusia in 1483. An attempt at an expulsion unsuccessful from Saragossa in 1486. But finally, perhaps at the end of 1491, but definitely in the wake of the success of the Reconquista in early 1492, that Ferdinand and Isabella came to a decision about their Jewish population. Ferdinand and Isabella started out as quite conservative monarchs, upholding the traditions of both their kingdoms, Isabella in Castile and Ferdinand in Aragon. But in January 1492, the Reconquista, which we had watched from the mid-11th century with the conquest of Toledo, in January 1492, the last Muslim stronghold in the Iberian Peninsula, which centered around the southern city of Granada, fall to the forces of Ferdinand and Isabella. Now, all of a sudden, the idea, the idea of a peninsula where the Reconquista has been successful, where the Muslim polity has been defeated, even if the Muslims remain on the land. Oh, that created many new ideas to gain currency within the kingdom, or at least ideas to to gain much more strength. It's probably not a coincidence that in Granada, on March the 31st, 1492, Ferdinand and Isabella, probably in the fortress of Granada known as the Alhambra, signed one of the most repercussive edicts in all of Jewish history, banning the Jews from Castile and Aragon. March 31st, 1492. They don't make the edict public. 
least not right away. It's going to take a few months to figure out the logistics of how it is that they're going to ban the Jewish population. How is the Jewish population going to move away from the towns and villages in which they live? The edict is finally made public at the end of April, in Aragon in early May, also in Castile. And the Jews hear the news. Something which was not in the edict but was implied was that if these Jews, Castilian or Aragonese, would decide to convert to Christianity, then they would be allowed to stay in their homes. It was very, very difficult for these Jews. It was difficult, obviously, for them religiously. It was difficult for them emotionally to decide whether to leave their homes. It's difficult for them to understand whether they could leave Sepharad, which was their homeland for centuries. And on a very, very practical level, it was very, very difficult for the Jews who did not live near the major rivers of the peninsula or did not live along the shoreline for them to figure out how it was that they were going to live, to live as Jews and to leave. What did the Jews do? Many Jews set about trying to dissolve their assets. But you can imagine, it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy if all the Jews were putting their homes and their businesses on the market at the exact same time. Housing prices, we know, fell, fell tremendously in these two kingdoms. Christians, cleverly, were waiting for when the Jews could no longer officially live within the peninsula. And that was going to be July 31st, 1492. They wait for the last week, the last days, before they would bid on Jewish property. The Jews didn't know what to do. At the same time, they would have, especially if they lived in the hinterland, they would have to arrange for transportation out of the peninsula. And then there were personal matters. How do you live as Jews? How do you live with your family and decide whom you're going to leave behind? Is it easy to move when you have small children? What about elderly parents and grandparents? And what about sick relatives? Often when we think about the expulsion and the decisions that the Jews have to make, whether to convert to Christianity and remain in their homes or to leave as proud Jews, we imagine them in such stark black and white terms. But the documentation that we have portrays individuals in very, very difficult situations, attempting to sell property, attempting to arrange transportation. Eventually, July 31st comes about. Oh, we make the general notion explicit that maybe a half of the Jews convert to Christianity and a half leave. But how do they leave? As I said, those who lived along the shoreline, it was easy, more easy for them, rather, for them to move to North Africa, or maybe to travel further to Italy. Most of the Jews who live in Castile and in the hinterland of Aragon have to find their way, let's say, down the Ebro River to ports, or maybe in Valencia to come to the main city maybe to come to southern Castile to attempt to leave. And then there are people, many Sephardic Jews, who know that there are two other kingdoms within the peninsula. There's the kingdom of Portugal and the kingdom of Navarre. Many Jews in 1492 attempt to enter the kingdom of Portugal. Not easy. Great monies were demanded by people at the border posts. Many folks in Navarre are not too happy with Jews from Aragon and from Castile attempting to cross their border. There's one story which really brings home, brings home the particularity of the expulsion. Some Jews right outside of the kingdom of Navarre who attempt to enter from the small little town of Biel, a small little village leave to try to cross the Navarrese frontier on July 31st. But we know 
that there was a thunderstorm. There were floods in the Ebro River Valley that day. And we know that this family, this family from the village of Biel, the wheels of their chariot, of their carriage, if you will, get stuck in the mud. And they remain in the kingdom of Aragon when the day of July 31st passes. And therefore, the next day, anybody who remained within these kingdoms were considered officially Christian. Oh, they had to officially convert. They had to be baptized. One could imagine how difficult it was for so many Jewish families. It seems to us that some families made decisions. Maybe we won't sell our property. Maybe some members of the family will leave. Some of the family will stay behind. And that's what they see, many seem to have done. Maybe 20,000 Jews go to Portugal, a few thousand to Navarre. Many Jews, at least at the first stages, go to North Africa and also to Italy. Many people have wondered about another voyager, another voyager who was in Seville around this time of July 31st. Many of you know him. He was Christopher Columbus. Many, therefore, wonder about his ethnicity and his religious attachments. There is no evidence about any other religious attachment of Christopher Columbus except that he was a Christian and that he was imagining he was going to find a route to the riches of the Orient, to its spices, and to its uh, great commercial possibilities. Yes, he did leave at around the time of the Jews' expulsion, and there were boats blockading the harbor. Some of the folks who come aboard, we know at least three of them, especially as chief navigator, were Jews who converted to Christianity. No, they were not looking for a place for a Jewish settlement. If they did, all they needed to do is take a little trip on this corner of the Mediterranean, and they would be able to find a haven for the Jews in North Africa. What about the Jews in Portugal and the Jews in Navarre? Well, the Jews in Portugal, as I mentioned to you, had a great difficulty entering the kingdom. The 1490s were very, very difficult for them. Extraordinarily difficult, hard times, children taken away from Jewish parents, attempts at forced conversion. And finally, in 1496, the king of Portugal, Manuel, harboring fantasies that the marriage of his son to a daughter of Ferdinand and Isabella might produce an heir who would control the entire peninsula, was willing to listen to the marriage demands of Ferdinand and Isabella, then named by the pope as the Catholic monarchs. He agrees to expel the Jews, to expel the Jews from his domain. Except it was much harder for Manuel than it was for Ferdinand and Isabella. And let me explain. Ferdinand and Isabella, economically, demographically, were able to expel the Jews because there was a large population of new Christians who had taken over many of the same uh, occupational niches of which the Jews held. In fact, these new Christians even expanded, as we saw, into positions of influence and power that went way beyond their former Jewish co-religionists. And as such, Ferdinand and Isabella economically and politically could afford to expel the Jews because the of the presence of new Christians. But that was not true of the King of Portugal. The King of Portugal did not have a large new Christian population Riots did not break out there in 1391 and 1392. And therefore, the king of Portugal was faced with a great, great difficulty. He could, yes, give lip service to the fact he would expel the Jews and indeed issue the edict in December of 1496, but could he afford to get rid of them? At first, Manuel chooses five towns on the coast from which the Jews can exit. 
He then says no, only from three. And finally, in summer of, 13, of 1497, only allows the Jews to exit from the main port and capital of Lisbon. Thousands of Jews, maybe as many as 20,000, descend on Lisbon in the summer of 1497. And when Manuel sees of their determination to leave, oh, Manuel becomes concerned that he might be losing a very important segment of his population. And what Manuel does is he blockades the harbor, sets fire to ships within the harbor that were maybe planning to take the Jews away to their new lives. And what happens essentially is that most Jews of Portugal cannot leave. And we have documentation which indicates that over the course of 1497, royal emissaries go up and down the Portuguese coast and even further inland and mass baptisms of Jews. And in the little kingdom of Navarre, also probably because of pressure of their greater neighbors, Castile and Aragon, the Jews here are forcibly expelled in 1498. They have nowhere to go. They can't re-enter Castile and Aragon because the Jews are expelled there since 1492. They can't enter into France because there, there have been expulsions over the course of the 14th and then even into the late 15th centuries. Essentially, with 1498 and the ex official expulsion of the Jews from Navarre, Sephardic Judaism in the peninsula seemingly officially came to an end but it's not that simple.